Hi, Rose. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, I can. Good morning. Good morning, Rose. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tino Cuellar, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. At this organization, we focus on how knowledge, ideas, relationships can help build a more interconnected world and promote global cooperation. One of the reasons we are having this event today is because our mission is advanced when we look at history and we understand what's happened, what we can learn from it, what might illuminate what comes in the future. And today, I'm very delighted to be joined for an event about U.S.-India nuclear agreement. Uh, with, uh, I'm joined by some terrific colleagues, I would say the A-team at the Carnegie Endowment, Ashley Tellis, who worked personally on the U.S.-India cooperation around nuclear issues, George Perkovich, one of our experts uh, on the nuclear field and technology as well, our Vice President for Studies, Chris Chivas, who leads and has built up our American statecraft program, my colleague, Rose Gottmuller, who is joining us uh, remotely and is uh, as experienced as anybody in the world of arms control. We're very happy she remains as a scholar at Carnegie. And of course, our guest of honor, Steve Hadley, former national security advisor in the Bush administration and uh, Yale trained lawyer, which is not a bad thing from my perspective. Why are we having this event? Well, for starters, any discussion of what will happen in the world in the next 20 years, as in the last 20 years, runs not only through Washington, D.C., or Brussels, or Los Angeles, or New York, but also through cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore. So as we try to understand India, its role in the world, where it's going, how it engages with the rest of the world, including the United States, we look back to get a sense of where things are going. Second. If there is one technology that has, in fact, reshaped the world fundamentally since its creation, it's certainly the harnessing of what President Kennedy called the deadly atom. And nuclear technology since then has produced civilian benefits, has reshaped geopolitics and geostrategy. So as we reflect on the future of geopolitics and global cooperation and peace, attention to nuclear issues, both the civilian and the military becomes important. But third, to go back to the point that I started with, learning from history. And the real inspiration for the event today is a rather remarkable book, uh, Handoff, that was written by uh, Mr. Hadley and his colleagues that reflects not only on the foreign policy challenges that the Bush administration faced, but particularly the transition, the move from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. Having lived through that transition, I can tell you that the process was enormously painstaking, carefully structured, carefully focused, benefiting from enormous research that is reflected in the book. The book is extensive and detailed, big enough to be used as a weapon. I hope that doesn't discourage you from reading it. But is also uh, something that will bring you back into where some of my colleagues were back in the transition, that sense of how complicated, intricate, difficult the world was, but also what insights could we draw from the experience of the previous administration? And how might we benefit as Americans from a handoff that reflected careful attention to the nuances? So with that, I would like to welcome you and our viewers and our special guest. And I'm happy to invite Chris Chivas to moderate the event. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Tina. Why don't we go ahead? Okay. Okay. I don't think I need that. It's not like a mic. We're all mic, right? <coughs> Super. Thank you very much, Tino. Um, and thanks to everyone, and especially Steve, for suggesting this. Um, I, I have to say, personally, I think the book is such an exciting thing because, you know, as a person in the think tank, um, especially one who, um, having spent some time in government, is eager to hear what, you know, what's actually happening. Uh, it's wonderful that you were able to release these, uh, these documents. It's a great resource for, for people working in think tanks and scholars, uh, both now and I think for many years to come. And um, even though the book is long, there really is a lot of interesting stuff in there with the essays uh, in addition to the memos that are in there and, and of course, your own perspectives, um, which is where I'd really like to start because today we decided we really wanted to focus on the India uh, Civil Nuclear Agreement 
um, and think about it both from the perspective of you know, what the U.S.-India relationship is about and how it has evolved, uh, and also from the perspective of the nuclear non-proliferation regime, because these are two basic ways um, that we can look at this uh, you know, important uh, decision that, uh, and um, uh, effort that you made uh, in the later years of the, of the George W. Bush administration. So what I was hoping you would do to get us started is to, first of all, just sort of describe in broad terms how you saw the strategic context that the United States, States faced in the second uh, Bush term. So this is in the years after the invasion of Iraq when a number of changes had been made. Um, there were many, many pressures, and this is clear uh, from your book, that were weighing on you as the national security advisor. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how that, what that strategic context look, looked like? And then explain to, uh, you know, to, to us how did you see India's role in this? How did India fit in uh, as a nation? And why was this uh, a bilateral relationship that you felt was really worth uh, investing so much uh, time and, and energy into? Great. Well, it's a great question. I want to <clears throat> thank Kino for having this event. I appreciate it very much. And my fellow panelists, thank you for joining. Thank you, Rose, for joining virtually. Um, you know, the, the initiative on India goes way back in the Bush administration. It actually goes back to the campaign. Mm. Uh, and one of the things Bush said very clearly was, uh, India is going to be a global power. You know, everybody was focused on the emergence mm. of China. He was focused on the emergence of, 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 of India. Mm. And he thought if India is going to be a global power, a actor on the global stage, we want it to be as a partner of the United States. And Bush being a big freedom guy, freedom and democracy guy, the fact that India also was a democratic, actually the world's largest democracy, uh, made it a natural partner in Bush's view for the United States. So he wanted to have a strategic relationship with India so that India, when it emerged on the world stage, would be a partner and work in collaboration with the United States to maintain the international order and solve international problems. So what we were looking for was a vehicle to try to make that happen. And everybody focuses on the civil nuclear deal. It was sort of stage two. Stage one was a series of, of uh, collaborations. We called it next steps and strategic partnership, where we would collaborate with India on defense and on various technology issues, but in a particular way, because the tension was we wanted a strategic partnership with, with India. And we thought at the end of the day, nuclear cooperation would be the vehicle. Why? Because it was a, a neuralgic point between the United States and India. And it was the kind of thing that if we could show the United States and India could cooperate on civil nuclear technology, it would break through to the populations of both countries that there was something new here. It had the possibility to transform the relationship and to transform the way the two peoples thought about the relationship. So the, the, in many ways, while it had advantages in itself, the civil nuclear regime and, and, and cooperation was a vehicle for transforming the relationship. Um, it was tricky because India had developed a nuclear weapon outside the non-proliferation regime, and had been sanctioned and punished for it, so as not to encourage other countries to do the same thing. And the question was, how could you square your desire to have a strategic relationship with India with not undermining the non-proliferation regime? And the way we tried to thread that needle was to say India would split its program, it would have a part of the program, which was its nuclear weapons program, which would be outside and on its own, but all the rest of its program, it would bring under the non-proliferation regime. And India, while not part of the non-proliferation regime up to that point, had been a good steward. It was not a proliferator, which was, of course, a problem we had with Pakistan and AQ Khan. So it had been a, actually on pretty good behavior in terms of not spreading nuclear technology and by putting its non-weapons part of its program under the non-proliferation regime, we thought it was a twofer. We bought, both brought India within the non-proliferation regime, and we laid the foundation for a strategic relationship with India. 
Now there's one issue, and then I'll stop talking, one issue that Ashley and I have, will disagree on. The question becomes, well, did you want a strategic relationship with India as a way to check China? Uh, and that was not the way the president saw it. The president saw it the way I, I described. This was going to be a major global power, and we wanted to be working with the United States. And that was the rationale for doing it. Um, it is true that in the, it has become a very wise decision given the emergence of China and uh, the kinds of resurfacing of things like the Quad, where India, Japan, the United States, and Australia are working together in part to deal with the challenge of China. But it was not the, the rationale that the president gave. There were two reasons for that. One was the more it was framed that we wanted a strategic relationship with India to check China, the harder it would be for India to enter into a strategic relationship because they wouldn't want to be used instrumentally just to check China. And of course, that wasn't the president's view. The president wanted a relationship with India for its own purposes because India was going to be a great power. The second thing is that the China we faced was not the China we're facing today. The China we faced was a, was a country that wanted to be part of the international system, wanted a benign environment so it could focus on its own development, and wanted a cooperative relationship with the United States. So why we were hedging by strengthening our relationships with Japan and South Korea and our own presence in the region, and in some sense by, by having a strategic relationship with India, that rationale was not really front and center center because one, it was not a good selling point with India, and two, because we were facing a very different China at that point in time. So that's, that's kind of how it came about and how the president thought about it. That, that's fascinating, and, and I wanna um, hear from Ashley and the rest of the panel, but let me ask you to pause on one point here, because the historian in me wants to hear a little bit more about President Bush's thinking about India. I mean, you mentioned that this was something that really was not so much personal, but really intellectually for him was very appealing. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about his role in, in, in seeing, recognizing that there was enormous potential in this relationship? What was it, do you think, to him personally, as a decision maker uh, and as a leader that was of interest about India? Uh, you know, I, I don't know in terms of his own personal history with India, how he came came to it. Uh, partly, uh, he's you know a pretty shrewd observer and has a strategic approach to things. And I think he just looked at the looked at where the world was going, looked where India was going, and thought this is going to be a player. I think also the fact that it was democratic mm. really uh, made a difference for the president because uh, he's all about. Uh, promoting democracy and freedom in the world because he thinks states based on democracy and freedom are going to be stable, are going to be able to provide for the needs of their citizens, won't go to war with one another, and are willing to work with us to sustain the international system, which is both consistent with our values and consistent with our interests. No, t no tension there. So the fact that India was also a democracy, I think, had a big impact for him. I think he would say, if he were here, you know, generally, our most successful relationships with other countries are with countries that share our values. And India was one of those. And so that's why I think it was, for him, it was a win-win. This was going to be a major power, but it was also a democratic power, mm -hmm. and therefore a natural partner for the United States. That's great. That's really, really interesting. Ashley, let me turn to you. And, and just um, so that uh, people are aware, I mean, you were deeply involved in this, both uh, as a, a National Security Council staffer working for Steve, but then also as a, as a Carnegie scholar, which I think is just such a, a great thing for us uh, to be proud of here at, at Carnegie 15 years um, later. I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit about um, how you saw the objectives with regard to India, how we ought to think about this moment um, in terms of an, uh, as an opportunity for strengthening. There was something special about this moment, I think, as an opportunity for strengthening the relationship um, with India. So um, maybe if you could, if you could start, with, start with that, that would be sure. uh, very helpful. Sure. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here with Steve and with George and with Rose. Uh, let me come at it uh, starting where Steve started out because it's important to keep that in mind. The path to the nuclear relationship and the nuclear agreement was paved long before the agreement was actually reached. And the agreement that actually broke the dam in longstanding US policy 
was the NSSP, the Next Steps in Strategic Partnership. Why? Because the Bush administration at that point made the decision that we were going to cooperate with India in two areas that were completely keep out areas for 40 years previously. And that was in nuclear cooperation and in civilian space cooperation. Nuclear cooperation, because of what Steve mentioned, India had an atomic weapons program which essentially undermined our conception of a global non-proliferation order. And the civilian space program was often looked at as a mask for building ballistic missiles. So those were two areas where there was absolutely no cooperation between the United States and India since 1974. Now to put a realist cast to this, I think President Bush figured out fairly early that standing US non-proliferation policy towards India had failed by 1998. And there was nothing to be gained by persisting with a policy that was only going to bring more grief all around. This was because of the test. Because of the test, right. Right. Yep. right. Because we were not going to talk India out of right. possessing nuclear weapons. So the question then became, you know, what policy replaces it? And I think there was a virtuous confluence of several things that came together. One was India's own emergence as a new rising power. The Indian economy was slowly liberalizing. It was creating new opportunities. India was growing at historically unprecedented rates. That was one. Two, don't forget the important impact that the Vajpayee government had on the perceptions of the United States. Here was an administration that was actively looking for a new partnership with India, short of an alliance. They never wanted an alliance with the United States, but they were willing to productively engage in a way that no government had done before. And the litmus test of that was actually the Indian government's response to uh, President Bush's policy with respect to uh, withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, the decisions that were made on missile defense, and what we call the new strategic framework, which was unveiled in 2001. The Indians were one of the few countries that actually supported us wholeheartedly. And that really gave us a sense that here is a government that's serious about a new relationship with the United States. And the Bush administration, I think, responded very fulsomely. So here was an opportunity that was waiting to be picked on one hand. And there was a policy failure on the other hand, a policy that had reached the limits of its success, which was the old non-proliferation policy. And I think what the president did was essentially transform our posture on both grounds. Reached out to India to seize the opportunity while also deftly changing our non-proliferation policy. And how did he do it? Steve mentioned the fact that the nuclear issue was neuralgic, and it's absolutely right. There was nothing that caused India as much dismay as the entire post-1974 nuclear regime that the US built up in response to its first nuclear test. And so for them, the acid test of US seriousness about a partnership was, if you want to treat us as a partner, then don't treat us as a target simultaneously. And so think about what you need to do to change the targeting of India through the non-proliferation regime. And that's where the nuclear deal began to become an opportunity. I want to make two other points which are very important. When the president began to pursue this route, and Steve saw this from the beginning because I remember Steve, when you came to Delhi actually in 2002, if I remember correctly, before the Iraq war, you already got a sense of what the pulse in India was. We had reached an early conclusion that if we were going to do anything along these lines, we are going to do it bringing the international community along. We're not going to do this against the wishes of the international community. And so unlike the Chinese, who made a purely bilateral deal with the Pakistanis to transfer reactors, the US-India civil nuclear agreement was engineered in a way that it would be done in tandem with the international community. And so we spent a lot of political capital first socializing the idea among our partners in the non-aligned world, in the IAEA, and so on and so forth. That was extremely important to recognize that this was done in a way that would be long-lasting 
And the way to make it long lasting was to get it national buy-in into the effort. A second point. This was also a moment of great transformation in US policy towards the subcontinent itself, where the nuclear deal actually became the vehicle for dehyphenating our relationship between India and Pakistan. Right? This was the bugbear that the Indians had been dealing with for 40, 50 years. And here comes President Bush and says, look, here are two different countries, two different histories, two different trajectories, and I'm going to treat them from the perspective of US interests. And US interests, actually, it was a juggling act of, you know, that required a lot of dexterity because we were deeply reliant on Pakistan for the fight against Al Qaeda and against the Taliban. And so we had to keep Pakistan on side, as it were. But we didn't want to reach the point where we were going to treat Pakistan as India's equivalent because that idea was becoming more and more nonsensical as time passed by. And so the nuclear deal became that classic proof where we're going to do something that is merited given India's importance in, for US interests while sort of avoiding any symmetrical treatment for Pakistan even though there were great pressures to do that. So I think it was a balancing act and I would say on balance, you know, the fruits of that initiative are now present for all to see, right? The one area where I think we fell short and I still haven't given up, was essentially with getting the Indians to buy US nuclear reactors. <laughs> and the reason I haven't given up on that is because the Indians themselves recognize today that they cannot meet their carbon targets without serious investments in nuclear energy. The, there are many issues that we can talk about on that right. question, but I think that is the one area we fell short. But on all the broad geopolitical objectives, building the new partnership, separating US policy towards India from that towards Pakistan, and then engineering an international consensus and support policy, I think we came out ahead. So you just, I mean, your, your comments uh, make it clear what an extraordinary amount of work there was that went into this on multiple different dimensions of, you know, of the um, Bush administration statecraft. But I mean, at, on a fundamental level, it sounds like there was just a recognition that A, um, uh, India was of growing importance, and B, the non-proliferation regime, at least with regard to India, or the approach we took in India, had not worked. Um, and so from very early on, there was, there was a recognition of the need to change that. C can you briefly summarize, for those who may not be as familiar with it, um, what the specifics of the civil nuclear deal were? I mean, what, there, was a, there was a separation between India's military program and its civilian uh, program, and an agreement to provide India with technology, maybe financing, other, other forms of cooperation on the civilian side, which then also fell under IAEA inspections, right? Is that the basic yep. Uh, agreement? Yep. OK. I mean, the basic agreement was that India would maintain its military nuclear program because there was no way we were going to stop that, right? Right. 1998 demonstrated that. But there was a huge area of opportunity, which was with respect to civilian nuclear power. But I want to make a bigger point, though. The civilian nuclear cooperation was the point of entrance to much wider cooperation. And you have to understand this, you have to understand the nature of the nested character of the nuclear nonproliferation regime, right? The nuclear nonproliferation regime protects nuclear technology at its core. But as you move towards the periphery of that regime, there are a variety of dual use and advanced commercial technologies that are also controlled. And so cooperation for us with India was how do you unlock India's access to all these? And that's where working on the nuclear question actually provided the key to unlock many other things. Okay. And because the nuclear regime was designed in that way, right? It was meant to bring as many of the key technologies that mattered under control. And so this was not simply about nuclear technology, even though that, as Steve pointed out, was the vehicle. It was a vehicle that opened many doors, including on space, including on advanced nuclear cooperation, like advanced reactor technologies, advanced fuels, and so on and so forth. So it seems like, the, I mean, and I think this is, um, for many of us, uh, would agree with uh, President Bush on the geopolitical importance of India. So there's a clear, compelling case there. Uh, I think that 
on the, the question of the impact on the nuclear nonproliferation regime, however, there was obviously a lot more debate. Um, and, and George, you, you were here at Carnegie looking at it more from that perspective. Again, I think it's wonderful that the two of you were, were here at the same time and looking at this from different perspectives. But can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the, you know, the concerns that you had, especially? I know that there were also areas of agreement. Can you, yeah. But can you explain to us how it looked from, from where you sat? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and it's great to be on a panel with, with Steve and Ashley, who are old friends and colleagues and whom I admire, and Rose, uh, we go back a long time too. So it, we, we had very respectful and friendly uh, differences on, on a lot of this, and, and in several dimensions. Um, one was, uh, personally, and I, I wrote all of it, I shared President Bush's view, which was this sh we should not instrumentalize India, period, ever. And that what I thought was animating a lot of people, not Ashley and not Steve, to support this and seek this deal was the idea that somehow India would be a better tool of the United States if we would uh, address this concern of theirs then they would help us out in the Indo-Pacific militarily and with the Navy. They'd buy a lot of our defense stuff. We'll get rich. They'll trade. There, there was a lot of advocacy of it that way. And, and I thought, no, don't, don't do it for other reasons. You, you want India. Our interest is in India being prosperous, remaining democratic, which is very problematic uh, now, improving the livelihoods of its people. That's our interest. That's a global interest. From that... I also viewed nuclear energy just wasn't that important. It was an obsession of the Indian establishment, but the Indian population doesn't care about nuclear energy, and that remains true today. Um, and so we were focusing on a thing that the Indian nuclear establishment would never deliver on. Like, I knew there weren't going to be nuclear power plants built. Now, it was sold in the United States as India will build eight 1,000 megawatt nuclear power reactors within the next you know, 10 years, zero today. Connie Rice said, India will add 10,000, this will add 10,000 new jobs in the United States, like zero. Uh, that's how it was sold at the time. Now, Ashley had a longer view. Stephen, the president, had a different longer view, but that's not what it took to sell it uh, in, in, in the system. So my argument was more with how we were trying to sell it, which I knew wasn't going to come true, and it hasn't come true for all sorts of um, reasons. The non-proliferation concern that I had uh, w was, again, quite different. And it was too nuanced to make it into the debate, really, because it was, I thought we should change the rules for India, because mm. India wasn't going to go back. And India had never signed the NPT. And we should change the rules. I thought this went too far in return for too little. And, and in fact, the Indians separating the nuclear program to civil and military, we said to them, separate it however you want. Um, so they got to say what they would put under safeguards. And so everything having to do with plutonium, they didn't put under safeguards, even though they said it was civilian. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so from the rest of the world looking at it, they said, this is a joke. And Phil Zellico, who's a mutual friend, who was a big part of it at one point, said, you know, he said, the Indians are looking at gift horse in the mouth. And I said, there, you said it. The Bush administration, which is hard line on everybody, is like totally unilateral and dictating. John Bolton's out there. And Phil, you're admitting it's a gift. I mean, we just gave, said to the Indians, whatever you want. And you can define you know, which things go under safeguards. Well, the rest of the world looked at that and said, great, that's your new friend, but you invented these rules. And now you're unilaterally going to the rest of us and beating the hell out of us in Europe and all the other capitals saying, you've got to change the rules because the US decides you know, India's our new friend. So for my concern, and it lingers today, and I'll, and I'll shut up, was that process of moving from what had been a desire for universal rules to a policy based on friends versus foes, I thought was going to be problematic. That policy has been continued by both parties' administrations there, thereafter, and there are very solid reasons for it. But what that did on nonproliferation and to the rest of the world was make the rest of the world much more cynical about, about the US about international regimes, uh, and about what big powers do, which, as, as a realist, Ashley would laugh and say, of course that's what big powers do. Like, don't be naive. But the international regime that the US had tried to build from the 70s on 
was meant to be uh, universal. And so this was a big change. And we're seeing it now, like, in the policy towards China and the administration's, this administration's effort uh, to decouple and create a, a technology block, basically, that will open itself, you know, open technology trade to members, but exclude China and so on. So it's abandoning things like the WTO for a friends versus foe approach to the world. And I think that deal was a big part of it. And the last thing I would say is that I think there's a very real possibility we'll do it again with South Korea, for example. And I could defend it. You decide, well, South Korea may need nuclear weapons, and so we'll have to change the, the rules, uh, including U.S. rules, because they're a friend and they're facing a couple of foes and, and, and our interest is in, in changing those. And you can make an argument for something like that, but it has effects in the rest of the world when you go around saying, well, we want universal rules here and we want universal rules. And they say, well, you actually don't. <clears throat> and so that, that was my concern about it. Can I just say one thing about Please, that? Please, Steve, yeah. One of the problems with we came up with the universal rules, and you see it in terms of economic globalization, you see it the nonproliferation regimes. There are a lot of ways. You know, those work when all the participants share the norms and values and are willing to support the regimes. Yeah. What happens when they don't? And what you have in the emergence of Russia and the emergence of China now are two great powers that have explicitly do not share the fundamental principles under which the international order has been based and want to change that international order to better reflect their own set of principles, which are more anti-democratic, more authoritarian, and all the rest. So the problem for these international regimes is where the underlying geopolitics changes. It makes it very tough to sustain those regimes. And you see it economically, you see it proliferation. Yep. All that, that's in, interesting. In India, and I want to get to Rose, but I, may, I think India's <laughs> ambivalent. I agree with you, Stephen. I think India's ambivalent about some of those premises for all sorts of historical, economic, and other reasons. And right. So they're on the fence on a number of these they things. They are on the fence. And so it's an interesting challenge, yeah. Yeah. Of course, exactly. the challenge to the rules in 2008 was not the same as it is today. Um, and, Rose, you were, and, and the, the perfect example of this, Rose, is the fact that you were actually, I believe, in Moscow at the Carnegie Moscow Center. Um, at the time that this was going on. So looking at this again from Carnegie, but from a very different perspective and what, frankly, from the perspective of 2023, looks like almost a different world, just uh, underscored again by the fact that you were there at the Moscow Center, which uh, sadly no longer exists. Um, I'm hoping that you can, you, can, you can comment on what you've heard here today and maybe also help us to bring the conversation a little bit to the current day because a lot of these issues are obviously still with us and we need to think some about um, you know, what the implications are for contemporary uh, U.S. foreign policy. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you to everyone who's there today, my dear friends and colleagues uh, across the stage. It's really wonderful to be here and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. <laughs> But uh, let me just say, you know, first of all, for Steve, Russia, the USSR was one of the founding members of the nonproliferation treaty regime after the, the fright that the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis gave us all. And up to this point, both Russia and China have been members in good standing of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty regime in general. I mean, we all have questions about their aid to programs like the Pakistani program and, and so forth. But in general, they have up, upheld the regime. So the question for me now is, uh, where do we go now with the nuclear nonproliferation treaty regime? This is a topic that George uh, opened very well, and I cannot be as entertaining as George Perkovich. But <laughs> I will begin by saying that She's when wiser. I was at the, at the Carnegie Moscow Center, in 2008, we were preoccupied with different issues around our study table there. We were very, I was very much thinking about the future of the uh, strategic arms reduction regime, which turned out to be good homework for, for the negotiation of New START afterwards. But I do recollect that the Russians were very perturbed because the United States was horning in on their captive market. They'd been providing the Indians with uh, reactor uh, capabilities and had been uh, trying for some time, and they continue to try to build nuclear reactors for, uh, for civil nuclear program uh, for electricity generation for the Indians. Uh, so it was a, uh, a matter of consternation, I would say, in Moscow, but I have to admit it was not one that I was wrestling with very much myself. But just to point out that the Russians, too, had a, a concern here about uh, our 
uh, taking over their, uh, their captive market. So in the case, and I've been listening with great interest, but in the case of India back in 1998, we had uh, several important factors. We had uh, a healthy democracy, as Steve put it, indeed the world's biggest democracy, a uh, good citizen in, uh, non, in nuclear terms, uh, generally speaking, except for the fact that they had tested a nuclear weapon, which uh, was a matter of consternation for us. Uh, but they were not uh, a nuclear proliferator and uh, were willing to separate their civil nuclear and weapons programs. And most importantly, the U.S. needed and wanted uh, a strategic partnership for big geopolitical reasons. And I think that those were important, uh, important reasons. It, was, it made up an important rationale to proceed uh, with this program. I wanted to carry us forward to AUKUS today so that we can think a bit about uh, its implications also for the nuclear nonproliferation regime. The difference with India, of course, is that it never signed up to the NPT. It was not uh, a member in good standing of the nonproliferation treaty regime because it actually hadn't signed the treaty. It, it did participate with certain of its policies in being that, that good citizen that we discussed a moment ago. Today we see with Australia a healthy democracy, uh, a good citizen in nuclear terms, not a nuclear proliferator, and the U.S. needs and wants a strategic partnership for big geopolitical reasons. So I see a lot of similarities in that regard between 1998 and today. But to my mind, there is no question we are testing the tensile strength of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty regime. Part of that testing is going on, again, because of the behavior like uh, of the Russian Federation. I've been very concerned that they are behaving at the moment like a giant nuclear pariah state with 4,000 to 5,000 nuclear weapons. That concerns me very much. They continue as part of the nonproliferation treaty regime, but the stresses and strains flow from that direction as well. Um, but what is the AUKUS deal going to bring to that table? The Chinese, of course, are already loud in claiming that uh, that the United States, Australia, and uh, UK are violating the nonproliferation treaty regime. I think the treaty is flexible enough to embrace this program. But I think we are going to have to consider very, very carefully exactly what it means for the NPT just at this moment, but also over the uh, four decades or so that it will take to implement this program and how do we not only sustain the tensile strength of the nonproliferation treaty regime, but ensure <laughs> that it is, uh, it is strengthened going forward and I think in some sense transformed going forward because Australia is not going to be the last country interested in nuclear propulsion. George, you brought up an ROK nuclear weapons program. I'm not going to embrace that notion at all because I believe in the strength of the U.S. extended deterrent for our allies in Europe and in Asia. But I can see the ROK looking uh, for a nuclear propulsion program, and certainly we know Brazil is interested. Mm -hmm. So sustaining the strength of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty regime over the long period of implementation of the nonproliferation treaty is going to take a lot of creativity, good imagination, strong policy sense, and continued commitment by the United States and its allies and partners. I can't say I have thought through all the implications and all the ways to wrestle with it at the moment. I'd like to endorse some of the thinking that good friend and colleague Bob Einhorn has been doing. He's not with us today unless he happens perhaps to be on the live stream. But um, I think that we will need to, as a community, think hard about what AUKUS means for the future. In the case of the India deal from 1998, I do take what George had to say rather seriously, that we didn't get the 10,000 jobs, et cetera, that we were looking for. But I would say that India has been continuing to be a rather good citizen in the nonproliferation arena overall. And I cite as evidence of this, it's, uh, it's uh, participation in President Obama's nuclear security summits and its efforts to continue uh, to work uh, as a good citizen in that regard. So perhaps I'll leave it there and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Rose, that's great. Let me just ask you so that I'm clear. <clears throat> Do you feel that um, the, the, the civil nuclear agreement looking back on it, had a, 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 a very deleterious effect on the nuclear nonproliferation regime or no? You, you, feel, you feel that it was not as, not as severe as some people maybe 
feared at the because, time. Yes, because India was not actually a signatory of the NPT, right. uh, I, I thought, it, you know, in the end of the day, the damage was contained and could be contained, particularly as India continued quite visibly in the years between 2009 and 2016 to participate in Obama's nuclear security summits mm. and to be quite active in that regard. So uh, I think the the deal did not deliver in other ways. Uh, those are the ones that, that George uh -huh. outlined in his right. remarks. It did not deliver the construction of eight reactors and 10,000 jobs in the United States, for example. But as far as damage to the NPT itself, no, I, I don't believe uh, that uh, it dealt a blow in that regard. I think, Ashley, you had made a similar point to me earlier, if I remember correctly, that it was neither as bad nor as good as many people predicted yeah. at the time. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, because I think the point that both Rose and George uh, you know, affirmed, which I think we need to remind ourselves, was we were trying to adjust a policy on the margins rather than fundamentally undermine a policy that had served our interests, which was the non-proliferation policy. And we could do it more easily in the case of India because it was not a signatory. So the challenge for us was how do you bring India into the tent by other means? We couldn't go to the Indians and tell them sign because they were not going to sign. Right? It resisted signing since 1968. But was there a way to get India to remain a good citizen of the order, reward it for what had been generally good behavior. And I think on those counts, we satisfied ourselves. The second point I want to make, when we were doing this with India, yes, the initial decision, or at least the announcement of the initial decision, was a surprise for the international community because of the circumstances in which that original uh, joint statement was negotiated, right? It happened at the very end of the process, there was really no time to do prior consultations that we might have liked, and so on and so forth. But once it became public, literally from the very next day, the president, Condi, Steve, folks at state, were making calls to capitals because we wanted to explain to them what the rationale was. And very importantly, we reached out to El Barade at IEA early on to tell him that, look, we're going to need your help to be able to do this. These are our objectives. And the objectives were framed in terms of strengthening the regime. And the basic question. But the nuclear suppliers group. Ab absolutely, absolutely. The basic question for us at that point was, here is India, it's tested nuclear weapons. It's outside the fold. Are we better off over the long term with India remaining outside the fold? Or do we look for workarounds that will help us substantively achieve our objectives of India playing by global non-proliferation rules? Or do we just let nature take its course? Mm -hmm. And I think the administration made the right call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have questions here also that are pouring in from the virtual audience in particular, so I warn you, but please go ahead. Steve. I have a question yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. for Rose and George. Yes, please. Yeah. The, when they rolled out the AUKUS agreement here yesterday or the day before, they took pains to say it is not inconsistent with the non-proliferation regime and that there are some controls on Australian access to nuclear technology to try to ensure that. Do you think it is consistent with the non-proliferation regime or do you think we have a, a problem now of looking like we're adjusting the regime to fit our geopolitical needs? Let, let, let Rose go first, because she knows more about it than I, I do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. But it's a great question. Rose? I was actually hoping you'd go first, George. I've been <laughs> thinking about this uh, since they rolled it out, first rolled it out 18 months ago, and I recognize from talking to people who know a, a lot more about uh, the details of the Non-Proliferation Treaty than I do, people like Laura Rockwood, for example, who's a great expert on safeguards that uh, they are concerned uh, about the way uh, that uh, so-called uh, Article 14 carve-outs will be used in this case. But to be honest with you, I know that there are people in this audience who probably know a lot more and have thought more about it than I have. What I'm struck with now is that we have the reality of this situation. The uh, administration was not turned from this 
from this pathway, nor were, of course, the Australians and uh, the UK, again, for very big and very good geopolitical reasons, geostrategic reasons involving China. So what are we going to do now? My view is that we absolutely must look for ways to make, uh, as I put it, to, to make sure that the tensile strength of the treaty holds and that we are able to uh, make uh, the policy adjustments that we need to make in order to accommodate what are going to be some future cases and ROK and uh, Brazil. Brazil is certainly lined up, uh, but ROK may be as well for uh, nuclear submarine nuclear propulsion programs. I, th I, th I think that Rose is pushing at the point, and it, it similar to the India deal with the big exception that India wasn't in the NPT, which is that within the letter of the NPT, the AUKUS arrangement can definitely be accommodated. Yep. You can fit it. The issue is there are other countries that if they wanted to do something similar, we'd say that's a nuclear weapon enterprise and it's cover. And, we, and we'd be all over it. And the rest of the world would say, well, wait a minute. You said it was all right for Australia. And so she, Rose mentioned Brazil. You know, for different times, people in the U.S. have had concerns about it, whatever. I, I don't. Well, Iran has talked about naval reactors, naval propulsion. And so there's no way that we, or let alone the Israelis, are going to, you know, tolerate that. And the Iranians and others will say, and the Chinese will join them because they feel screwed by AUKUS. And they'll say, wait a minute, you said it was okay for the Australians. So I think there's a way to address it. And, and Rose alluded to it, and, and, and Ellie Levita and Toby Dalton of, of our team have been working intensely privately on this, is to encourage the Australians to uh, make commitments that go beyond what's quite required in the letter of the IEA safeguards. So extra transparency, because it may involve fissionable materials. Voluntary you know, inspections, and so you you adopt a position as Australia, who's a great non-proliferation uh, you know, uh, supporter, could adopt positions so that then you could say to the Iranians or others, yes, but Australia is doing this and allowing this kind of inspection and so on. And so, so that's an effort that I think the administration is tacitly supporting, but Toby and Ellie are out networking with the IAEA and, and, and others. So I, I think it's redeemable. Um, it's just, fascinating, it's fascinating. Um, I do want to get to some of these questions from the audience, and I want to turn a little bit also, uh, we've been talking about the non-proliferation aspect of this, but there is also the India aspect of it. And, and Steve, one of the first questions that, that came in, and we've got it in a couple of different forms here, is how would you assess the state of the U.S.-India relationship today under the Biden administration? Um, you know, in general, have, have things worked out the way that, that you had hoped or the way that, I know you can't speak for uh, President Bush, but the way that you imagined he might have hoped? Um, and and, and how, do, how well do you think things are going today? Well, that's a good question, and others here on the panel will have views. You know, I think um, the relationship between, Indi you know, I guess I want to say one thing. The, 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 the breakthrough under the Bush administration built on efforts that were made in the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. And Bill Clinton went over, I think had a, Rose will know, a six-day visit to India at the mm -hmm end of his administration. So this is a case where the Bush administration built on the Clinton administration and the Obama administration built on the Bush administration. This is the sort of the untold story about continuity in foreign policy, which you wouldn't think there is any of if you listen to our presidential election debates. But in fact, there's a lot of continuity in our foreign policy. And this is an example of it. So I think the relationship, the, there is a strategic relationship between the U.S. and India now. It is not an exclusive strategic relationship. India continues to have relationships with Russia and to work out its uh, complicated relationship with China. But I think the strategic breakthrough that we have been working at as a country over these four or five administrations is a reality today. Um, there are uh, trade-offs. And you see the, the, the dilemma. The, you know, the Biden administration very much wants India in our quarter to deal with the challenge of China. And I think as a consequence, when the issue becomes how much do we complain about India buying discounted oil for Russia, how much do you claim, complain about that when it's in the context 
of wanting to encourage a strategic relationship with India to deal with the problem of China. So, you know, that's just the way life is. There are trade-offs, <laughs> and the Biden administration is, is, is faced with those kind of trade-offs now, and they will continue. The other issue is what do you do about what's happening inside India now, and, and com concerns a lot of people have that, that democracy within India is an, a pressure. How much do you say about that if you're the Biden administration? How much do you do publicly? How much do you do privately? Uh, generally, with our close allies, the, the right formula is praise in public, criticize in, in private. My guess is that's what the Biden administration is doing here. But, you know, so I would say, one, success. We do have a strategic relationship. Two, doesn't mean that don't, there aren't problems that have to be addressed. Yet. And, and three, there are always trade-offs. And the Biden administration is struggling with them now. I mean, Ashley, I wonder if the, you know, the, the, the fact of the agreement itself and the other efforts that were made to strengthen the relationship may have raised hopes, you know, perhaps unrealistically high. Is that in terms of the, the future of the U.S.-India relationship and that, you know, it's easy, it would be easy given, you know, the problematic challenges uh, in the relationship that Steve just described, especially having to do with Indian domestic politics, uh, to be frustrated about the way things have gone. But when you look at it in a long-term perspective, there's still a lot there. Is that, is that accurate or, or do you have a different well, view? I, I think it's basically accurate and I think the perennial danger is always to have higher expectations of India than India has for itself. <laughs> and so there is a realism that is required at our end with respect to what we want of India and what India will do. Let me just say something about the argument that we had discussed in the Bush years. And it's most clearly articulated, actually, in Condi's speech in Japan at Sophia University, where she said, we want a relationship with India because we want it to be part of a network of powers in Asia that will essentially provide an equilibrium. And then she later talked about you know, a balance of power that favors freedom in Manhattan. But the general idea was, we don't want a relationship with India because we want India to do things for us. It would be nice if India did things for us, but that's not what we are in this war. What we want is to help India build its own power realize its own best ambitions for itself. And if it does that right, it creates an objective balance of power in the broader region that serves our interests. Now, as long as you hold to those goals, we're in a very good place. But it's when we start getting ambitious and saying, oh, it's not enough that India sort of you know, reach its own ambitions, but start beginning to think in terms of things it can do for us, with us, et cetera, et cetera, that we begin then to get complications. And it's not that India can't get there, but it will take a lot of negotiation, and it will not get there if it undermines its own interests, right? So you've always got to be cognizant of we have US interests, and from the perspective of US interests, we want India to do certain things. But if that is not in India's interests, it's not going to happen. And to the degree that there are overlaps, yes, there is room for beneficial agreements, beneficial modes of cooperation that serve the interests of both. And we want to be wise enough to figure out the differences between those two. I, I would just add that, that what Ashley just said was super eloquent and, and I think exactly right. And especially for students who may be watching, or anybody, there, there arises from that a big tension with our domestic politics. So Ashley was identifying a very large, exceptionally large country, India, with which we have an interest in them actually prospering and doing well and ought to try to facilitate that. Some would say that is altruistic or whatever. He was laying out how it's not because it creates an objective balance. But in American domestic politics, the idea of acting and providing benefits to a state where you don't explicitly say, here's what we're getting for it, is very difficult in, in, in our domestic politics. And it's gotten harder every, every year in the last 30 or so. And so, so then you either have to be duplicitous and overpromise, or you have to instrumentalize the other actor. Can you say, well, we're doing this because we're gonna get X and Y, which then alienates them because it's pretty impossible to educate 
Congress, let alone the public, why we'd have an interest in somebody else kind of being better. But you've had to deal with this. I think it is, it's what presidents uh, get paid to do. Okay. Uh, and the third way is for the president to explain that there is short-term strategic interest and long-term strategic mm -hmm. interest, mm -hmm. or short-term benefits or long-term benefits. And in the long term, mm -hmm. this is the way to build a strategic relationship mm -hmm. that will, over the long term, be very much in American interest. There's just no substitute for a president to be willing to you know, take that burden on and explain the, what is the sort of in the en enlightened self-interest of the country. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what presidents get paid to do. Arguably increasingly difficult in our current political no environment. Question. Rose, uh, I want to uh, give you the opportunity to, um, to offer a last thought here before we close. Well, I want to say that uh, I do believe that we can do some very good work. And I do think, frankly, it's probably time that we take a good hard look at the nonproliferation treaty regime and think about its future. We had the extension conference in 1995 that extended the treaty uh, indefinitely, and that was the right thing to do. But uh, I think that we also need to take a good hard look at it to ensure that the flexibility within the treaty, first, is well understood by all, uh, but second, that we have um, a uh, a good view of the treaty into the future, because if it is, and it will be, uh, as I see it, uh, an important part of our international uh, policy environment, our, our policy uh, universe, I think that uh, everyone needs to uh, be reminded of that for the, in the first instance, but also that we need perhaps to do some work to ensure that its inherent flexibility is also well understood by all. Thank you, Rose. Um, let me conclude just, Steve, by saying thanks to you for uh, publishing this volume, which, again, is a great resource for all of us, um, both individually as scholars and also because it gives us the opportunity to have conversations like this that both look backward towards the past but also forwards towards the challenges that uh, America faces today and will face in the future. So much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And thanks to our audience. Thanks, Rose.